everyone. Welcome to Hear Our Voices. Today we have Yosefa on today. She's going to be talking about FEPS and city FEPS and things like that. So hope you enjoy. Sit back and relax. It's going to be an interesting conversation. Let's get into it. So can you tell us a little about what you do on a daily basis with this program? Hi. Um, yes. Um, it's a really exciting time to talk about the program. So I. Um, I do policy and advocacy work for a provider of shelter for families with children. So we work with FEPS and City FEPS, um, you know, on the provider side, we help our families apply for and get the City FEPS voucher to be able to move out of shelter, right? Because for so many of our families, they're working, they're doing everything they can, but like housing is so expensive in New York City that there needs to be something. There needs to be help to fill that gap between what people who are working are making and what the actual cost of rent is, right? right? So seeing that it just, the voucher wasn't doing this, that it wasn't actually making, filling that difference, bridging that gap, that's where my policy and advocacy work kind of came in because we said, well, you know, what do you mean? So families are, are qualifying and getting this voucher and then they can't find something. And so what we found was that it was just, it pays too little money, right? So for a family of three or four people who was looking for a two bedroom apartment, um, City FEPS was paying less than $1,600 a month. That was the maximum rent you could find. You, you were allowed to like go out and search for it. But our families were not finding two bedroom apartments for less than $1,600 a month. They're just not out there. Um, so that's where our campaign started to bring the city FEPS voucher up to be the same level as the section eight voucher, right? The section eight voucher is based on what's called fair market rent. It's an actual calculation where HUD looks at the rents in New York city and in real time says, this is what housing actually costs. Can I ask a question before you go on? Sorry. Please. People might not know what HUD is. Can you explain oh. that also when you use mm -hmm. like things like that? Thank you. <laughs> yes. No, I'm sorry. You know, it's funny. Sometimes you get used to always talking to the same people who talk about the same things. Um, HUD is the federal agency. HUD stands for Housing and Urban Development. Um, so they're the federal agency that handles all of our housing infrastructure. So they fund public housing, they fund the Section 8 program. Um, they also, in a lot of ways, fund shelter. And so their Section 8 voucher is widely considered just kind of the gold standard because of, it, because of how well it works, how well it really helps people find housing. And not just find housing, but stay in housing. Um, the city FEPS voucher that the city developed is its own voucher, and it's kind of a, a it's kind of been like a bad imitation of it, so to speak. So what we've been trying to do is bring it closer to that gold standard. That's good, that's good. So what she's talking about by putting up the, the amount, the increase was like, um, what's called 149 or 148 interim? 146, yeah. Interim 146, 146, I'm way off. <laughs> no. <Thank you. laughs> There are thousands of intros. Trust me, you are not that far off. Um, <laughs> we've been, we started, real number, we started working on this four years ago. It's taken us four years to do this. We've tried working with different parts of the city to make, to make this change, to make city FEPS work by increasing the amount. Um, and, you know, we came up on dead ends where we found allies was in the city council. Um, you know, in the city council, they write bills and they pass legislation. Um, so that's one way to force the city to increase the amount. That's the, that's, that was the avenue we ended up taking. Um, the bill number was intro 146. And we finally passed the bill. The city council voted in favor of the bill just not last month, but the month before at the very, very end of May, almost in June. So it has been passed. We have increased the city FEPS voucher to section eight. What does that mean now? That means that for a family of 
three or four looking for a two bedroom, they can now search for something up to $2,200 a month, right? So that's a big jump. That's excellent. Because I know a lot of people, they contact me on Instagram from YouTube and they can't find apartments or they don't know, like, how can they do this? I'm like, I really, it was very hard for a lot of people. I know that for a fact. And it's just honestly hard to find apartments, even people who's taking the voucher. So it's just, it's very, for the number to go up, it makes, it brings out a lot of room. They can find places to make their like family a family again, you know? So that's a good thing. So I have a question. Is it different for singles and families? And do you know the difference? What they have for like FAPS and city FAPS? Yeah, the amounts are different based on your family size um, because, you know, the apartment size that that you would look for is going to be different. So for a single adult, um, you know, I have to confess, I don't have all the numbers in front of me, but for a single adult, the amount is is lower Um, for a family that a one bedroom would be right. So for like a parent and a child and one child, the amount will be lower. Um, you know, I talk about a family of three or four because that's kind of the middle road, but then as families get bigger too, you know, families of four or five, then the amount is higher, right? The idea being that you're paying for the right size housing for your, for your household, for your family. My next question I have for you, what's the qualifications for FEPS? Because when I initially, I try to apply for FEPS. Or city fest. I'm not sure which one has been about four or five years now. And they told me at first that I have to do this, this, and this. But when I did part of it and I didn't know it was another part or added on, I didn't qualify. They told me that I have to get have an eviction. And they told me that that's what they, all they told me. I just need to get an eviction from my landlord. Yeah. I got that. And then when I went in, they said, Oh, your name was not on the lease. So I was in, I was renting somebody's in their apartment. And then I didn't owe the lady any money because I didn't, I didn't owe her any money because mm-hmm. I wasn't back on rent. I just needed to get, get the um, eviction for PATH and try to do for city FAPS also. So tell me some of the qualifications that people would need to have to qualify for this particular program. And it doesn't matter if you're single or with family, does it make a difference? Good, good differentiation. Um, it does not make a difference between singles and families. The um, eligibility requirements, the qualifying requirements are the same. Um, for So for city FAPs, and there's, it's, it, it's funny, it's confusing because there's a state program called FEPs, which is a rental voucher. Um, the, the criteria on that one are a little more narrow. And maybe that was the one that you had applied for in the past. The state FEPS voucher to be eligible, you have to um, have an eviction notice. So you have to be in in an apartment. You can't be homeless. You have to be in an apartment, but you're being evicted for it. Um, Shorthand, people refer it as FEPS to stay, like FEPS to stay in your apartment. Um, State FEPS, there's also a state FEPS that is for um, people fleeing domestic violence. that is colloquially called FEPS to go, like FEPS to leave a, a terrible situation. Um, those, those vouchers are much more narrow in um, how much they're given out. The city FEPS program is much broader and is the one that we've worked on and have increased the amounts on. Um, I have a qual- question before you continue on though. Sorry to interrupt, I just wanna just get everything out and really get people to know what these programs are really about. It's just so yeah. interesting. And I know some stuff, but I don't know everything. Um, with the domestic violence one, do they have to have police reports? How do they prove their domestic violence people? I have to be honest, I don't know that level of detail either. I don't know how you, you document domestic violence. I don't know if it's police reports. I don't know if it's self-attestation is sufficient. I don't know what the burden of kind of proof, so to speak. Um, is related to the state FEPS. Understand. So yeah. the city FEPS program, what is that one? What, how does that, how do you qualify for that one? Yeah, that was a little broader. To be eligible for city FEPS, you do need to be in shelter for at least 90 days. Um, and once you've 
um, fulfilled that 90 day in shelter requirement, you also have to be working. So you have to have some employment income to qualify. There's a few other more detailed qualifications having to do with, um, you have to have applied for public assistance, for example. Um, your income also has to be below, you also have to be in the very low income, income category. So having met those requirements, you submit your application. That said, the application to your question, excellent question around what it takes to show um, DV, that application is not always straightforward. Um, there are kinks in the system for submitting your application. Um, but once you do have your documentation around income, time and shelter, et cetera, um, family, families and individuals who qualify receive what's called what people call a shopping letter. So it's a letter from um, the city that says, here is your pre-qualification for the program. Um, you should look for an apartment up to this amount. Um, and this letter serves as proof to landlords when landlords are looking to see what your income is to make sure that you can afford the apartment when you do the apartment application. Um, that letter is what helps, is what you kind of provide as part of your application to the landlord. Makes sense, makes sense. I have another question. So, um, do you see that certain boroughs take these shopping letters more than other boroughs, or you think it's about the same across the board? Because a lot of people say it's hard to actually find apartments in New York City because people are discriminating against some of these letters, which they shouldn't because it's technically against the law to do it. But people yeah. find a lot of different ways to say no without making it seem like it's not that they're saying no about. So can you get more into that? They do, yeah. You know, and one of the things that's been always been hard to untangle from um, so, source of income discrimination is what you're talking about. Like a landlord can't discriminate against you because of where your money to pay your rent is coming from. Um, as long as it's a legal source that you're getting your money from, um, a landlord can't turn you away for that reason. That's, you're correct, that is illegal. <laughs> but you're also correct that there's a lot of ways that they say no without exactly saying what they need. Um, and one of the places where a lot of those landlords that are breaking the law, one of the places where we think they hide has to do with the rent amount, right? Like they sent their, their rent like just a couple dollars above what that voucher was knowing that then, you know, that was their way out. Um, and it's, it's in the other part that's, that's hard to like suss out, like, why maybe some boroughs or even some pockets like within boroughs um you see more people being able to use vouchers if that just has to do with those being areas where the rents are the lowest right because that voucher that was only paying 1600 for a two-bedroom apartment i mean there's got to be like there you know there's very few places in new york city where those are even the rents um so right. it is true that we would see um you know, from our side, from our shelter, families who did manage to use the city FEPS voucher, they'd end up going to like the far ends of like the Rockaways is where they would find rents at that at that amount or, um, you know, in very specific areas, I want to say in the Bronx as well. Um, but it's hard to know, like, is it because landlords are more willing to take vouchers there or is it because that's where they found apartments that were, you know, they got lucky and found that apartment at that super low rent. That's interesting. I've, a lot of people told me they find places in Bronx, in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. I've never realized that Rockaway is probably an, another ground of finding places, but that's so far out. If you think about how far, that's why the name is Far Rockaway, I, I would assume, because it's so far out, like in connection yeah. to a lot of things in the city, like Manhattan and things like that. So for a family, I guess if you're looking for if your family to really have probably a house, depending where you live in Far Rockaway, there are a lot of houses out there, so it might be good for having a lot of space, but it might be far away to, from getting to know the exact things that you need. Yeah. So what things, what common problems do you see people who apply for city FEPs run into? Yeah, and I'm going to say one more thing about the boroughs too, because I think it's a big deal that 
to be, you know, now, now at the section eight levels, there, there are actually apartments available in Manhattan at the section eight prices. And we think it's important, like it's important for people to actually have choice. Yes. It's not fair to say to people, you know, we know that, you know, your family and your kids schools and whatever else are here in, you know, central Brooklyn, but we're going to only give you a voucher that will only give you an opportunity to move out of shelter if you move all the way out to, for example, Par Rockway, which is going to be a two hour ride or, you know, however far from where you are now. Exactly. Um, so it's also been about creating choice and, you know, opening up other neighborhoods and other areas to um, to people who, who are looking to set down roots or are looking to, you know, move out of a shelter and to kind of start on a, on a different, on a new future. Makes sense. Makes sense. <laughs> so, so some some common hangups. Um, yes. They're te- you know the application can sometimes be hard to do. Um, there are you know if you are applying from shelter, your um, your housing coordinator, your case worker, or whomever um, should be able to help you. There you know there's also nonprofits called um, home-based providers to help with applications because the application is not straightforward. It's done online. Um, and there are documentation requirements related to pay. So, you know, you have to be employed, you have to have money from employment to qualify. So you have to sh- provide a pay stub or another, some other document showing it. And for some people that's not, you know, some people maybe aren't working on the books or don't necessarily have a stub for last week, but they have it for two weeks ago. Um, and that is sometimes a place where um, the voucher, getting the voucher gets tripped up. Um, we're hopeful that with the increase in the amount, actually finding apartments will not be a place, <laughs> will not be one of the things that holds people back from, from moving. So, if a person doesn't have all the stubs they supposed to get, they can't qualify for this program. Or because, like, example, if you have a contract job or a consulting job, or not, probably not contract consulting. It's not like every week, but you still get. You see, the money is going in the bank. You notice, know, like, kind of thing. It's like construction worker who doesn't have their own business, but they get money from the people who are giving them the money. How does that work? Do you not qualify for that? If you have a certain amount like saved in a bank, at least they could pay for a certain amount of months rent and we just need yep. this extra help. How does that work with that? Yeah, you the in those circumstances, in, in those situations, yes, you will qualify. It's just a matter of working through what documents need to be provided. And sometimes that's a back and forth. Like maybe if it's instead of a pay stub, you have some type of an agreement or, you know, like you just said, um, the money's coming in. So you have a bank statement that's showing a steady income from something. Um, it's not the person wouldn't qualify. It's just getting through the paperwork of it really is what it comes down to. And that will be around each person's, um, you know, what each person's documentation, what their setup is to work with um, the city who ultimately makes the decision um, to get that accepted. And, you know, a, a a social service organization can be a real ally in helping untangle that and helping with the back and forth with the city. Yes. Like she was saying before, um, a lot of home bases help you because I've people I've come into a lot of contact with people said that my housing specialist is not doing anything. And I had that problem too, that when my I had a couple of housing specialists in one of my shelters. A lot of like the first one I had, I was like, I had to ask the director to switch me out. I'm like, if she's not gonna help me with this process and I see she's helping other people and I'm not getting anywhere, I need somebody else who's gonna help me and who actually care about what's gonna happen to me. So if you don't if you're in that situation, I wish I ever thought about it at the time that I knew about Canva and these places and Catholic charities, I just wasn't thinking of using them because I was in the shelter. You can definitely call through one one and see which one is closest to your shelter and they'll be able to help you with this paperwork. If you think that your housing specialist is not doing their job and that you just need the extra help in that particular area. That one feel like feel like if the housing specialist doesn't do it or you don't have one at the time that you're just lost in the water. <laughs> um the city does put out, you know, different services out there, nonprofits but can help you with this venture. 
So I want to get into how long is a city FEPS? Like, how long can you have it? Because I know NYCHA is like, you can live here as long as you under the certain requirements. I already know the answer, but you know, people just don't know the answer. I'm going to make sure you, you know, get the information out there. NYCHA, you can stay alone, uh, basically until you die, and they'll pay as long as you um, are under certain requirements. Yeah. And what can also make a person while they're in city FEPS a certain amount of certain time get their city FEPS thing canceled? Can you get into those things? Yeah, sure. Um, and that's a place where, where we have more work to do to make city FEPS better. Um, so city FEPS, um, you do have to recertify your eligibility every year. Now, as long as you still meet the requirements, you can have it for five years, six years, 10 years, as long as you still need it. Um, one of the, the, the main requirement has to do with your income level. Um, you need, if once your income rises above 120% of the federal poverty line, you would lose your city FAPS voucher. Um, and this is problematic, right? Because the difference between what you can afford making minimum wage, for example, and what you can what you make, the, the difference between what you make at minimum wage and what the rent is becomes huge, right? So you, in other words, you might be making a few dollars too many to qualify for the voucher, but you'll lose it. And that means that then you'll have to pay the entire rent, even though that rent is still not affordable to you. Um, and there's a real danger in that. So part of what we want to do is continue to work to reform city FEP so that it mirrors section eight. The way section eight, the section eight voucher works is that as your income goes up, you, you always pay the same percent of your income to rent, right? So as your income goes up, you're paying more and more to the rent. It's still just a 30% of your income until the time comes when you, the rent is affordable to you. And that's when the voucher goes away. Um, there's no cliff. There's no there's no hard cutoff. It's when your income is thirty when your thirty percent of your income is equal to your rent. That's when the voucher uh, goes away. That's not the way City FEPS is set up, but it's the way we are working on getting it set up. Do you think that would ever happen for City FEPS to be more like Section Eight and more like NYCHA? Um, we probably would never thought that it would, the rent would have gone up so much this year, but I think because of what's the pandemic, I think that kind of pushed it a little more to say like, we know we did, probably didn't in their mind they didn't want to say oh people can't you know pay their rent or they just they didn't need it before, but I think the pandemic really pushed them to make changes in a lot of things. Before we couldn't find money to do anything, and now we found money to give all these kids laptops and tablets. So. I don't know. It's like somebody's like, oh, I want to save the money, but what are you saving it for? If not to make the world better, you know? So I don't know. But exactly. Do you have any more information you want to give us about City FEPS that I might not ask you about? Um, what else about City FEPS? I would say that these increases that just passed, um, they they the bill was passed, but they the increase doesn't go into effect for until the fall. Um, so just if you are out there um, and you're applying and you're using it now, just know it's not immediate. You know, the city bureaucracy, it takes a couple of months to actually go from we've passed this to, OK, here's the effects in the actual voucher. Um, what else? I would definitely say um, stay tuned um, to social media, um, to the hashtag city FEPS. City and FEPS spelled F-H-E-P-S, um, because there is work around making changes like this one so that the voucher stays with you until you can afford your rent. Um, there will be social media work and there will be opportunities to kind of keep learning more and even get involved um, following the hashtag. And that's what comes to mind for me right now. What else? Is there anything else I can tell you did that okay? yes since Any technically it was passed for the money to rise a while ago because right now we're, if you don't know we're in july 2021 and it says we're not gonna pass into the fall do that money that people were like because it passed earlier would it retroactive to that like from 
months ago or they just continue it from September? Because technically it was, as you said, it was passed already. So the, right. I think the people should have got the money now, especially knowing that a lot of people are struggling and have lost their job or just have less hours because of everything happening. Are they going to plan to pay back that back rent or are they just going to continue from September? Yeah, the likelihood is that it will not be retroactive. Um, back rents, I don't, you know, there's just like such a patchwork of programs that it's it's not fair to have to go to so many different programs. Back rents, um, there is, there are other programs for back rents. Um, there's one shots and there's the emergency rental assistance program. ERAP, yeah. ERAP, that's right, yep. Um, <laughs> Also, <laughs> we have acronyms for everything too. Right? I know. I'm um, learning them too. I'm so proud of myself. I'm getting there. <laughs> yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And those also home-based providers are leading the support, um, like help applying for ERAP and the back rent programs. Um, so city FEPs wouldn't cover those. Um, I, yeah, I, it has not been answered like, for sure that it won't be retroactive, but being that there are programs around back rent, I'd be really surprised if the city, um, you know, put city FEPS money toward back rent versus, you know, moving forward. I want to get into this part also, immigration, mm -hmm. because I, it just popped in my head and I'm trying to make sure in every podcast there was certain like services to make sure people know if they could qualify or don't qualify based on if they're a citizen or a resident or a immigrant, like who doesn't have paperwork. So right. what, how does city FEPS do with that? Did it change during the pandemic? What can you tell me about that? You know, unfortunately it did not. And it does need to change city apart. One of the pieces of city FEPS eligibility is, um, applying for public assistance and being eligible to apply for public assistance. And most, depending on actual immigration status, but undocumented immigrants are not eligible for public assistance, not eligible for those because that's federally funded, um, which means that undocumented immigrants would not be eligible for city FEPs, um, although they might if there are family members who are eligible for public assistance, so if there's a parent who's undocumented, but their child is a citizen or has another status that makes them public assistance eligible, then this, they would be eligible for city FEPS. Okay. The problem is though, then you would get a city FEPS voucher in the amount for one person and not oh, for the two okay. So it doesn't really get you anywhere, you know, like, and, you know, to treat members of the family as invisible or like they're not there because they don't have a certain documentation is, is terrible and wrong. And yeah. a place where um, I think New York City has an opportunity to lead to um, as a sanctuary city to say, you know, we are, we're going to fill the gap. We will use our dollars to make sure that families can stay together and to make sure that um, everyone has a safe place and that we're not forcing people to choose between staying in shelter or crowding into a studio apartment because they can only get a voucher for one. You know, those types of situations are terrible. If you don't know what sanctuary city means, that means like New Jersey, New York, I, don't, I can't think of any other states right now. We are basically, I don't know how to explain it, but we are saying the immigrants who don't have paperwork, you can come here and we won't de like deport you kind of thing. So right. that's cool to be in a city that um, who welcomes everybody because my family is our immigrants. They, do, they, they came here, you know, paperwork legal and everything. But the point is that my family is not from here. And what if it was my mother or father who had to go through that problem and all of a sudden I'm losing them because they didn't have a paperwork. It's, and and it's, but they still work here and contribute to the society because they pay for bills they eat food here but it's not they're not welcome here it doesn't make any sense to me and most of the time they're very hard-working people so it's like you're, you're kicking out the people who are doing the most work but honestly the little a um, little amount of money so yeah. it's kind of I'm, crazy i'm hopeful that we'll see some progress so erap yes the new, the new um the rental the the assistance to pay back rent because of covid hardship 
yes. um, is available regardless of your documentation status. So I think that's a, I think that's a really important precedent. I think that's a big step in the right direction. We do now finally, finally have a program out there that's saying you're a person, you're a yes. human being who needs help, and you're somebody who does contribute, even if it's not on paper. You're an important part of our community. You're making important contributions to our community, and um, we're going to help. So. I'm hoping that that's that's a, a glimmer that that sets a little bit of precedent and that other that we can start to bring that same thinking into other programs and other benefits that are available to yes. everyone else who's here and, and part of us. And also don't forget about Project Parachute. They also are made just for you know immigrant families who have those kind of difficulties and helping for paying rent. So don't think New York forgot about you guys. We are trying to, you know, have everybody included into everything that we do and things like that. So mm -hmm. I have another question, it's like the family dynamic. So sometimes when you go into paths, you, unless you are married or domesticated, you can't um, go in together as a family like it could be a, a, a lot of the, the father's actually on a birth certificate too for the child in case that like how that works out but what if that per does the same rule apply for feps does that person have to be related to you by blood or things like that or if it's like oh my mom wants to come in but she's not in shelter with me right now does how can that work out or does it not work out for you, how they do everything does that make sense it does make sense okay and I'm, I'm trying to think it through. My understanding, I'll, I have to say that I have not, I have not run in, run into this. So I'm not speaking from direct experience. My understanding is that each person has to be part of the household composition in shelter um, to be part of the household for the voucher. Uh, but I feel like there have to be ways in which um, that can be expanded. Um, but I don't, I don't know enough about it to really like give you specific concrete information for, for anybody to go on. I'm going to be honest. I was just asking, I'm like, what if your mom was in a nursing home, but you couldn't afford a nursing home anymore, but you want to keep her in your house? or if a child was taken away by ACS, would they had to count that? That's where my mind is going. I probably go to the worst scenarios ever in, in life. Probably doesn't even happen that often, but you just never know. It could be that one family who has this problem. They're like, I'm stressed out. I don't know what to do. So that's why I asked that kind of question. <laughs> so- Yeah, of course. Yeah. No, for sure. And what, ha what happens if right now, you know, what, if, what happens if in three months, you know, your mom can't live alone anymore and needs to come live with you and you're exactly. using a voucher to pay for your apartment? Like, how does that work? Exactly. So I, there, I know that there have to be ways to your point, life, right? Life, life happens and circumstances change and there has to be a way to continue to adapt um, the voucher because it is a voucher that stays with you, right? Or also vice versa. What if, you know, you're, as you get older and your kids move out and it's just you, you don't need a two bedroom anymore. Um, it, you know, it can go in the other direction too. Um, there have to be ways that the voucher adapts to needs because it does stay with you. I don't know all the mechanisms for doing that. So with this thing, because you say you have to have a public assistant case, that means everybody in the family would have to be on that case then, if that's the case. It can't be like, oh, I have three kids and I have my husband, but I only put the kids and me on the case and the husband's not on it. So if that's the case, they're not gonna add the husband to make the money go higher to be able to right. do that, right? If right, exactly, works. exactly. And that's what happens with uh, fam with immigrant families of mixed status, right? If they're not, somebody's not on the public assistance case, then the voucher doesn't cover them either. Oh, okay. you're exactly right. So just make sure, guys, if you can add everybody to the case, I know some people feel a way of having their name in the system, but if you're eligible to add yourself to that case, add it in and you'll get more money for your voucher and get a better living condition for you and your family. So yeah do you have any last words to tell the people out here who are listening to our podcast last words i i think there's i think i i think there's progress i think things are going to get better for housing um i think things are going to get better for you know this in, in this city where it's so hard to afford 
rent. I, I, I think I think times times are changing. <laughs> I'm hopeful. That's just my little bit of optimism, but I am hopeful. Okay. So guys, if you want to see a change or just keep update with things like this, you can follow FHC's Twitter page. You can follow different other Twitter handles and look at hashtags. And if you want to retweet them to help out the cause, to help make, even if you're not in it right now, maybe it could be you in the future. You never know when you can become homeless and not need services like this. And if you started from now, honestly, it takes a long time for these things. I was surprised to get through any legislation or anything like that to even get better funding. So help out the community at large. And if you help one person in the community, you're being a better person. So thank you for listening to Hear Our Voices. This is Kay Did coming to you. Thank you so much and talk to you next time. Hello guys. This is future tense right now. A lot of these video the podcasts actually were recorded earlier in the year. And because of that, um a lot of information has changed as you might know that since September first of two thousand twenty one, that City Feps have up their amount for each person whether if you had city feps before or city feps right now the amount went up for everybody so that's the good news and i hope this information that we give you is helpful and you're able to share it with other people thanks for listening